take care of it. You're going to have to pay at your own expense to go get your fingerprinted. Now, they say it's not much, only $65. But what's happening? You're just adding cost to those who can ill afford to pay. If they want to pass that, why do they say we'll fingerprint you at the expense of the state? So, these are the type of things that I, uh, why I veto bills. There's a lot of bills that I veto, and some of them I go like this when I even write the veto is so bad. Do you know that we have a bill in the state of Maine that if you're a foreign national, this one was passed last year, but I can't forget it. If you're a foreign national and you want to live in the United States and get a visa, the day you arrive, if you had committed a sexual crime in your foreign country or another state, when you arrive to Maine, you will voluntarily go put yourself on the sex offender list. Voluntarily. Yeah. We haven't had anybody sign up yet. <laughs> but they're here. It's insane what we pass. And what do we do? That's all red tape. It's all on your backs. It's all the books and books and books. And um, what I call ridiculous red tape for the sake of feeling important. And they feel important because it's an election year. They're all left now. They're going to say, we did a lot of good things. We put out a, a program for needle change, uh, exchange so addicts and people that have diseases that are putting out some clean needles. Except nobody's going to buy them because there's no money. We're going to have, you know, our ambulance drivers, we're going to give, we fought to get them a raise. But there's no money. I did manage, however, to get a new prison for $150 million that's going to have a drug treatment facility in it, and it's going to have geriatrics, and it's going to have mental health for people that are incarcerated. Big thing. <laughs> don't read that newspapers. The other thing that we did that you don't probably haven't read in the newspapers, all the kids in the state of Maine that want to go on to higher education once they get out of high school, are going to have interest-free loans from the state, and if their employees, once they graduate, hire them and they pay off student loans, they will get a tax credit, a complete dollar for dollar tax re reimbursement, and the student, all they're going to have invested is a good job and a good education. <laughs> so we have done a few good things. And with that, I'm going to open it up and we'll have questions. Now that all my friends have left. <laughs> all right, our first question is coming from Justin Leary. Where are you, Justin? So again, I'll just call your name and I'll come up to you. You'll be able to ask your question to the governor and then we'll open up to that Reporter Dave, I hang on to the microphone, folks, so don't try to grab it from me, okay? <laughs> uh, governor, uh, which states do you believe demonstrate uh, benefits of eliminating tax, uh, state income tax, and then I guess I would prefer that to say you know, why, you listed some of them before, just compare why you think that would translate to a May. Okay, very simply, uh, right now the state of uh, Oklahoma, for instance, this one I haven't mentioned, they've dropped their income tax at 4%. Uh, as soon as they did that, there was a company in Portland named Bible Foods, they moved to Texas. I mean, the owners, the owners that uh, Bible Foods was sold to people in Oklahoma. Within a month, they moved half the business to Oklahoma. Two reasons, taxation and energy. So, if you put more money into the economy through people who earn it, who were in it, and they have small business. Maine tends to be small business state. Instead of the state taking the money and deciding where they're going to spend it, we let people keep it and put it in their business. They grow their business and they hire more people. That is a much better strategy than the redistribution strategy that we've taken. And we, instead, as I said earlier, we're making some improvements on welfare reform. I've been working on it five years. First three years, uh, modest improvements. This year, 
election year. And I campaigned on it and had these town hall, and that was a top of my topics was welfare reform. Well, the Democrats this year, when I say Democrat, incidentally, there's a few of them that claim to be Republicans, but they're really Democrats, have changed their mind and said, you know, maybe he's right. And so they gave us everything we've asked for the last five years this year. You can no longer, instead of us giving you money to go to a strip joint, have tattoos, buy tobacco, liquor, you can't do that anymore. We finally made the decision that if you're going to do that, I don't know. that money, that money, the millions of dollars that we spent on there. Now let me tell you, the budget for EBT cards the state of Maine is three hundred thirty million dollars a year. Three hundred thirty million dollars a year. And on the day in which the cards are loaded, between midnight and three to four a.m., fifty percent of the money is gone. If that money was left in the businesses of Maine, we would not be as poor state as we are, because that money would be working for the businesses. But we're not. We're giving it, and then we're spending it. And we, as I said earlier, you spend your money much better than we do. And so I really believe it's better in your hands than in our hands. Because of prioritizing. I believe the most, number one priority in the state should be the people of the state. The Natural Resource Council of Maine believes the most important thing in the state is the environment. They do. And that's fine. That's their priority. This is how I look at it. If you only concern yourself with the environment, and not people, then you have poverty. If you only concern yourself with people and not the environment, you have an economic, I mean an environmental catastrophe. So you need to find a balance. I have always been willing and ready to work with Maine People's Alliance and Natural Resource Council of Maine to find a balance for good jobs but a, and being a good steward of our, of our environment. Government when I came to, to, you, to become your governor, I had no interest, no interest in doing anything uh, for jobs. In fact, the most difficult agency to work with was the Department of Environmental Protection. <coughs> this morning, I had somebody meet with me this afternoon, I should say, early this afternoon, I met with a gentleman, and he said, I don't know what you did, but it is there the dream team in that in organization. The people you have in there now find solutions, not complaints. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. That's what we're talking about. It's just a different culture, a different attitude. I believe investment capital goes where it's welcome and it stays where it's appreciated. Now let me give you an example to, to that. Recently I met with the Council General of Taiwan. I met with him back in December, telling him we have some, some paper mills in Maine. We would love to have, they want to invest in the U.S. I said, come in, invest in the paper industry. We have some mills. So they hired a company, a very well-known national, international com uh, consulting company, to do an assessment of where to invest in the United States. About a month ago, they came in, and this is what they, they, the meant the, the Meeting lasted about five minutes. Governor, thank you for inviting us to look at the paper industry. We hired a consulting firm, and they did an analysis of all the major states that are in the paper industry, and we found out that Maine is the highest, 19th highest cost of doing business in the United States, and that Wisconsin and Minnesota were less expensive, so we're going to Wisconsin. That's what I mean when you have a government that has their own priorities instead of having the people's priorities. So if you let the people spend their own money and their own priorities, they do a much better job than the government. Next question, Evelyn Fleur. The other thing while she's looking is 
Madison Paper Company was not going out of business. Madison Paper Company is a global, large corporation. They're just moving to Minnesota. Yes, it's about about to have and I'm all, all for you, what you're doing. I'm a widow. I've been a widow for 21 years. I have my own home, pay all my expenses, and ask no help from anyone. And I think a lot of other people could do the same. I, I would agree with you. Uh, I will say this. A, a good safety net in a, in a system is very, very important. Everybody will hit a bump in the road. And I'll give you an example. A young man, uh, in fact, a very close friend passed away just recently, and he had two kids in high school, a very young man, had two kids in high school, he owns a home and a car. He, he struggled with cancer for four years, but the state couldn't help him, because in the state, if you hit a bump in the road and you have cancer, and after the, a year he lost his insurance, because after a year, after the COLA left out, he had no income, couldn't get any help from the state. But you can come here and get welfare like this if you say you don't have any money and you don't have a reason for it. It doesn't make you do it, but if you have any asset, we can't help you. So there have been occasions in the state where people come from other states and they come here or other places, they come here and they demand services. I, now I'm not against helping anyone if they turn around and help themselves. But if they take without giving back, I have no use for it. I had a lady send me an email. She's in Texas, and she says she wants to move to the Northeast. And she was evaluating Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire. And she asked me, what services did we have to offer her? And my response was, uh, why don't you just stay where you are, because it's a great warm e economy, and you should not be asking me what I can do for you, but what you can do for my state. <laughs> and I'm sure you all heard that before. In my lifetime, a president, he was campaigning at the time, but a, a, a future president, I learned that when I was about 12 years old. So. You know, it's not a matter of not wanting to help. It's a matter of let's have a partnership. And I'll provide you with the skill sets, and I'll supply you with, with starter, you know, starter money, but you've got to find your place in the world. This next question comes from Claire. She doesn't want to be identified, but she, and you did touch on this a little bit, but this is what she asked. How do you like your new dog, Vito? And thank you for rescuing it from the shelter. My 12-year-old Yorkie Monet weighs six and a half pounds. Yeah. Well, Vito weighs about 18. He's about twice the size of Baxter, who passed away a couple months ago. So my son is the one that brought up the name Vito. But we got thinking last night, so I asked my wife if I could get two more. I'm thinking of getting one I'm going to call Sustained and one called Override. <laughs> I think we're going to be hearing that joke for a while. Uh, Jay Malone. Going. In other words, 
I look at the thing that we have here, and there's five uh, Republicans, and, or six Republicans, and five Democrats. So the entire state, obviously, is, is a Democratic House. What do we need to do to advance when coming to the that's, 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 that's an excellent question. What we need to do, and, and I'm not going to tell you to vote Democrat or Republican, because that's not the issue. I'm going to tell you something. I have more trouble with my Republicans than I do with many Democrats. I would say it's great Democrats to <laughs> many. Uh, and I, I, I sometimes hesitate to name them because the party might turn against them. Really, seriously. Uh, I'm always, uh, we're all, you know, well, I'll, Barry Hobbins, for instance. He's in a dogfight right now with a young man named Chanette for the primary. And I will tell you something. Barry Hobbins has been a great asset to the state of Maine. Bill Diamond has been a good asset to the state of Maine. John Martin, whom I, can't, I don't get along on anything ideologically, but if I want to get something done, I call John Martin. So, some people, it doesn't make any difference what party you're in. The issue is, there are three types of legislators. One is the ambitious ones, blind ambition. I want to win, and that's it. And it doesn't make any difference what you say or do, I want to win. The second one is personal enrichment. They go to Augusta with one thing in mind. I have a personal agenda to make myself wealthier. And we've had governors do that. We have legislators do that. I've been involved in a federal lawsuit over that. It is real stuff. It is the real deal. Then there are people that really care, that do it not for the money. They, they'll get beat up every single day, either by the press or by the party, to do certain things. But they keep doing it. A lot of them, like today I hear somebody was criticized for taking a walk. Yeah, maybe even I get criticized for taking a walk because he took a walk on a bill I think he should have voted against. But the fact of the matter is, that's one time. Nobody looked at what he's been doing for two years. He's been one of the best Mainers in the state of Maine in that legislature He's a man who's been retired. He's given of his, of his life day in and day out, most of his career, and he makes one mistake and they want to throw him under the bus. So my, my thing is, you've got to figure out who is running and you've got to hold their feet to the fire. Ask them what you want them to do. Demand that they do what you're, if they want your vote, you can demand that they be honest. And that is the most elusive thing. In a matter of fact, I often say that honesty and politicians is an oxymoron. <laughs> and if you are honest, and you're brutally honest and blunt, be ready to fight the establishment. And be ready to fight the press. Because that's the real world. Hi, Governor. I'm Chris Lumpia. I'm a business owner here in Lewiston, and I am a hard left in the world. Get that kiss going. Um, and I'm not here to be young. Uh, I'm here to let you know that I'm one of your constituents. You're my governor. I didn't vote for you, but you are my governor. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know why you say that. I guess that shock that surprised me. You just said that. Well, because I challenge the administration. I mean, I challenge the status quo, and I get and the left tries to impeach me on bogus arguments. Okay, so I guess what I was going to—I don't know if I really have a question. It's more a statement. It's just that it's saying I speak to Mayor McDonald about this as well. But stuff is written and said that it gets pretty vicious. And as the leader, you know, the stuff that just happened here. It's crazy, kooky, dumb stuff. It really shouldn't happen. It wasn't okay. It's not, not nice to you. That, that shouldn't happen. But by the same token, we expect it from young student kids, and then we're based in um, But from our leaders, 
I hope that they will speak to me too, even though I didn't vote for them. I hope that you will be polite and respectful to us in your public discourse and your addresses. And while the liberals in the House here and in the Senate will go against you on a lot of stuff and, and they'll, they'll do vicious things, you're the leader. And so is Bob McGonagall the leader of, of this town. And I would just ask you to bear in mind that this is the face of someone who you say pretty mean things to. And I pay your bills. You know, I pay your, your salary. And I, just pay you. <laughs> I, I understand you want that done. I don't understand you want that done away. It would not apply to him, though. Let's be clear. You know, I, I hope you get it, too. It's, it's, I get it. I get it. Thank you, anyway, for listening. But, I, I, you know, I get it. But I will tell you this. For the constituents of the state of Maine, every Saturday I meet with constituents. I don't ask if they're Democrat or Republican. I do town halls. I don't put a sign up there that Democrats are not invited or you know uh, uh, liberals or socialists. It doesn't make any difference. What what it, what really offends me is you. Everybody expects me to be uh, honorable, sincere, and polite to them. But have you watched and read the newspapers the last five years? You know, after a while, it gets on your goat. And uh, I do very, I, I work very, very hard at keeping my sanity against some people. In fact, now we, we have to hide and climb out of windows to avoid the press. Because there's no, there's no upside. You know, I, I'm 67 years old, and I tell my children, the last time I knew it all, I was your age. <laughs> well, every day that I get older, I'm dumber. And I get that. But for the last five and a half years, I have not been 100% wrong. End of story. So when you do something right, you ought to get credit. I never got, you, ne you never heard boo about the good things we've done. I ain't got criticized for paying the hospitals by the press. So it's very difficult. And, and I'll agree, you're right. You're absolutely right. But it's very, very difficult to get hit every single day for six years and turn the other cheek. So tonight, these young people, I, I can understand where they're coming from. They're young people from base. They're very wealthy kids and they don't know what it is to work. They don't know what it is to, to go hungry. They don't know what it is to fight the battles every day. But when people come to me and say, you don't care about people, that is the fighting words. Those are Andrew Jackson words. And just as a liberal, let me tell you, I don't think for one millisecond you're a racist as you have this Looney Tunes. Um, and I agree with you on a lot of stuff. You know, potato chips for EBT cards, it drives me insane when I'm standing in line watching a guy buy potato chips with his EBT card, pull out his cell phone and buy cigarettes and cash. And I think your deal with the prison is fantastic. It would definitely be applauded. But it tends to get lost in some of the other stuff and the angry stuff. And, I, you know, I want your good stuff to be highlighted and the other stuff to be diminished. Anyway, thanks for uh, letting me speak. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Next question, George Matthews. Sure. Where are you from, George? Oh, Auburn. First of all, thank you, Governor, for these town halls. I know it's, it's a lot on you to do these week after week, and it really means a lot to all of us. So thank you for that. Yeah. I was listening on the radio this afternoon to your good friend Howard Carr, <laughs> and I don't know if you're aware of this, but he had a poll out as who should be vice presidential candidates. It was about uh, 10 or 12 names. The winners were Dr. Ben Carson and Governor Paul LePage. <laughs> we're too much of No, I don't want to go to Washington. I already told them what I want. Well. My question was kind of that, I don't think I have to read it, but uh, I know you've got your plate is full for the next couple of years. After that, do you plan to be in politics at all, or what are you planning to even think that far ahead? Well, yes, I am thinking that far ahead. And yes, I likely, uh, if I don't go to work in the uh, Trump administration, I will probably seek another position in politics. But what I have told you, Thank you. What I have told Donald Trump is this. You know, I want to save the federal government some money. They got a $20 trillion debt. I want to do my part. 
so what about if i become the ambassador to canada in the summer and jamaica in the winter? this next one does not have any on it and uh, the person has asked me to ask it i have a good paying manufacturing job right now in lewiston what do we need to do to keep these jobs here okay there are three things that we need to do not only to keep jobs here but to bring jobs here ideally we lost airbus now airbus is like boeing they're very large uh, european manufacturer of jets I spoke to the chairman, and he asked me two questions. I said, we'd like you to consider Brunswick, Maine. We have a, a naval air station. It's got a great runway. It's got all these hangars. We'd like you to come to Maine and look at them. He said, I'd be more than happy to do that. You've got to answer two questions. What's your energy cost? I said, we're the cheapest in New England. He said, no, no, how do you compare against the rest of the country? We're looking at Alabama. They're at four cents. Yeah. I said, well, okay. What's the second question? Are you right to work, Steve? I said, we're working on it. Let me tell you, and, and I hear this by union people all the time, it's rhetoric, but if I, I will just tell you the honest truth, and you can do your own research. I don't need to do it for you. Right to work states make more money than union states. It's that simple. Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, go look at their per capita income. Go look at their economies and then look at our economy. Look at Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. Do you know that out of the top 10 welfare states in the United States of America, five of them are New England states? The only one that's not is New Hampshire. No income tax, no sales tax. So, is, am I an anti-union person? No, no. Matter of fact, when you run a company and there's a union, you only have to deal with one document, that contract. If you're non-union, you've got to deal with every individual personality. The issue is, if you're able to work and you're part of the company, for instance, I just read last, last Wednesday, Linda Bean started a lobster processing plant on the coast. She's had it for a couple of years. Last Wednesday, on her 75th birthday, she sold it to her employees. They own the company. She walked away. You can do that in a right-to-work state. You can't do that all the time if you're stuck in unions. I'll give you an example. I, we're fighting a battle now. I, 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 I heard it at the state. There's a company in Maine that was sold. It was it's in a very precarious position. The industry is a down, is a, is going down, and they got to reinvent themselves. Now that happens every once in a while in, in companies. You know, you got to reinvent yourself. You got to come up with new products. You got to do certain things to reinvent yourself to stay alive. So they wanted to keep certain people, and they thought, and it's a union shop, so they thought that if you keep, keep some key people that you need for the future, that the thinkers, the creators, you know, those that are really, really important to bring you to the next level, you give them a little extra money. Well, if you're a union shop, that's a grievance. Now it's a big battle. It's a, there's a good shot, they won't make it because they are highly leveraged in the new purchase. So, you don't have that flexibility. For instance, I was at Martin's. Martin's, got one of the, maybe not the highest pay, because it's retail, but they have the 
best benefit package you could ever think of. They're still one of the few companies you still get a turkey at, at Thanksgiving, you get a Christmas gift at Christmas, and you get profit sharing, and you get a 401k with matching from the company. It's unbelievable. But when you're profitable, they share the profits. When you're not profitable, you don't share the losses. And so, you can have that type of environment if you don't have a big contracts. I'm thinking, in my mind, one of the worst organizations in the state of Maine, and you're going to hear more about it because I'm coming out with, uh, uh, we're going to be doing something different and special this summer. I'm not quite ready to announce it. Is the MEA. The Maine Education Association is the worst organization in the state of Maine. And I'll tell you why. They collect dues from each member. And they I have been asking them every single year, you take $5 million of your money from the dues, and I'll take $5 million from the general fund. We'll put it in a, in a fund for teachers to get advanced degrees, advanced education. We'll share it. We'll be partners. And we'll get them to get master's degrees, doctorate degrees. All they got to do is put the time in, we'll pay for it. Good deal. I sent them a letter the first four years. Every year I send them the same letter. I have yet to get an answer. We have some of the lowest paid teachers in America. We have some of the highest burdens on our teachers in America. What are they doing about it? They're not pounding on my door to give them more money. They just want to make sure that I collect a fair share for those who don't want to be in the union. That's what it's come to. It's no longer what it used to be. They've gone by the wayside, and now it's about American people fighting for American jobs back on this soil and away from foreign countries. We are having too many jobs leaving the United States of America, going to Ireland, Canada, the Far East, because our tax structure is is unreasonable, it's the highest in the world, and our regulatory burdens are the worst in the world. And until we learn that, until we have a president that fights for the American people, then we're going to be struggling for, a middle, uh, for having a middle class uh, or, uh, structure in our country. Right now, we have the poor and the very, very rich. And the very, very rich, they walk. If they don't like it, they just go someplace. I, I've gone to Jamaica, and there's an area of Jamaica, it's all Americans, and they're all very wealthy people. That's what happens when they're not happy at home. There's $2 trillion of cash laying on foreign soil right now that could be invested in the U.S., and they're still mostly all American companies that want to go, what is called an inversion. They want to Burger King. They go to Canada, and now they're part of uh, Tim Hortons. That's what's happening, folks. And who suffers? The middle class people of America. The middle class suffers. The upper class, they got the money. So we're losing our middle class, and our country is getting older and poorer because the poor have to live on fixed incomes or constantly battling for health care, battling for Social Security to keep up with the times, and uh, they've already spent all that money. And since all, most of the people in this room are too old to make more babies, we've got to get young people in this country. That's why we're trying to pay off student loans, so we can attract young people. Because, frankly, there are more people dying than being born in Maine. And that's a recipe for disaster. We are the oldest state in America, roughly 44 years old, and the youngest is Utah at 29 years old. And that's rounding up. They're under 29 years old. Median age. So we have a lot of work to do. In, in fact, I'm thinking about going to Puerto Rico for the next couple of weeks and bringing up about 100,000 families. <laughs> all educated, all under 30. <laughs> Governor, we have about 10 minutes left and uh, three more questions. 
Curtis Jack. They wouldn't have any financial trouble down there. We could help them out. <laughs> Governor, I want to thank you as well for having the town meetings. It's always uh, it's a good sign when our leaders come and, and listen to us. So thank you for that. And um, I don't always agree with you, and you did not always agree with me. And I think your statement at the beginning was very important. One of the things I, I've often wondered is to what degree we can really judge, for example, what you're doing by what we read in the paper or what we see on TV. So that the chance to have you speak directly to it is important. And my question, and something I've wondered for a while, is um, the kerfuffle, which is one of my favorite words, about the, um, the referendum uh, and the, the funds that were not released by you. And we, um, so we've heard from the papers what the reasoning was, and I wanted to hear directly. Which ones? Are you Which talking housing? about the bonds? Yeah, the bonds. Thank you. The housing bonds? Uh, yes, they either okay. tie to uh, lumbering or, or energy or, or something like that. And oh, uh, uh, LMF bonds. Those LMF. have been released. Okay. Those are released. I'm holding out some other bonds, and this is why. It's $15 million of senior housing bonds. This is the problem with those bonds. I'm holding them out until next January, and I'm going to try to go back to the legislature and ask them to send it back to you. This is the problem with the bonds. It's $15 million. If the debt service is going to be paid for by all of us as a state, and the only responsibility of a developer is to ask for the money. And one, and I'll give you an example. I had a legislator who came in. He's got a project, $5.2 million. They're going to put up 500000 I put up $4.7 million, and they control the rents. Is that a good deal? That's why I didn't sell the bonds. What you're hearing in the newspaper is a big farce. Those bonds were direct, and I'll, I'll tell you when you'll hear more. You'll hear more later. But let's put it this way: these bonds were deliberately established to help three organizations. They were all going to get a piece of the action. Don't pay anything back to the state, and I make instant millionaires. That's why. I am not selling those bonds because they make instant millionaires. There is no, nothing tied on them. Now, what do I want to do with the bonds? Two things. I would like those bonds to help elderly stay in their homes longer, to help them with mobility issues like grams, being able to reach up in the cupboards and be able to move around their house, do those kind of expenditures. So rather than go into assisted living, stay in their homes longer one project. The second project would be, the second thing I'd like to do, is it a project of housing? Let's say you build a housing for 30 units for elderly housing. I would like to have a, uh, a uh, e-medical service there, or what do they call telemedicine unit at every housing unit for elderly. So if there's 30 apartments, let's say there's 30 people, you could have as many as 60 people that pay is could have more, but it depends on the elderly. Let's say that they're all married and not widowed, and they're, and they're, they're two to an apartment, 60 people. We have a telemedicine unit on site. The housing bonds that we have in the state won't pay for that because the feds won't, won't get involved because we use uh, non-exempt uh, tax exempt bonds. So we could pay for that. We could buy, put the unit in, pay for the equipment. Then we go to a hospital and we say, all you got to do is put a an IRED practitioner in there. And people can just come right down, get some health care, you know, get your shots, get your medication, those type of things at the telemedicine unit. If, and they check you over. If you have an emergency, they can send you right out to the hospital instead of rushing to a hospital if you don't need to. It would be free. The hospital would pay for the personnel, the state would pay for the unit, and then they would pay their rent. It would be included with the rent. That's all I've been trying to say. I had a deal with the Speaker of the House until we got into a tip about a certain job. <laughs> and he dropped it. Now the bill is written that I will sell $15 million worth of bonds. They will go. There is nothing to do with rents or anything. You just give them money and they're millionaires overnight. And that's why I'm not selling them. 
And the LMF bonds, I'll tell you why, those were held back. What I wanted to do is take some of the revenues that we were getting from cutting woods off state lands, use some of that money to help people. This is when oil was $4 a gallon. To help people change their heating system to a more affordable, more efficient heating system. That the state would get involved in providing low interest loans or grants to rural areas so people could get affordable heat. And that went down the tubes. Why did they go down the tubes? Do you know why, folks? The Natural Resource Council of Maine did not want that money used for anything else but conservation land. Now, you say conservation land, that's a good thing for the state, and I agree. I would agree. But we have 17 million acres. Conservation already has over a million acres in it. Over a million acres. And how did it work? Natural Resource Council of Maine, or these trusts, these land trusts, will come to a town and say, we want to buy that block of a thousand acres and take it off your tax rolls, become non-profit. And then they come to the governor and they say, will you sell bonds to pay for that land? And then you, we all pay for the bond. And I'm saying, how much conservation is enough when people are the lowest paid in New England? When do we start paying for the people? When do we start helping the people? And you know what I did? I pulled a fast one this year. And with the help of Senator Alphon, he and I were able to put two bills in. One, provide students interest-free loans. The state will pay, but we're paying for our kids, not land. And then if the employer hires them and work out a deal, and they pay off the student loan, we give them credit, the student gets a free education. That, to me, is better spending than conservation land. Governor, I think we have time for one more question, and we do want to remind folks that we have a contact your legislator sheet on your way up. You'll be given one of those. It has all of your legislators um, on here with their contact information, and we encourage you to get involved and in contact with them. Do we have any legislators here tonight? We do? Heidi Brooks? So we've got through all the questions. We typically don't have legislators ask the questions, but you did submit one, right? I did. Um, Governor, I appreciate your being here and having conversations with the community. And I do believe that we are representing 100% of our community. Um, that being said, my question had to do with health care issues and uh, specifically uh, lead levels in our community being very heavily affected, and there are other communities around the nation that are very heavily affected by that issue, the lead in the water, and then with private wells, maybe, you know, perhaps the arsenic levels are very concerning as well. Um, There's so, a problem in Lewis and Auburn? Is that well, what you're saying? There is a problem in Lewis and Auburn with okay. lead levels. Um, I will get on it tomorrow morning, as first I hear of it, because I've told the DHHS back when the problem with flood came out, is you make sure that every community in the state, every community in the state has their water tested for lead. Yes, um, I, I think it is critical that we come together on all levels, like local, state, federal, do what we need to do. I mean, it's, it's something where the situation has been focused on the lead and the paint and dust, and that with Auburn levels, Surfacing in November, some households being tested a little, you know, elevated. I, you know, the course of New Hampshire has a zero tolerance for school water, and so I think if we tested the water instead of the children, all of us, everybody in this room, would be better off. And I believe we believe that too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if there's a problem, if you're asking me to test for the sake of testing, I'm a little skeptical. But if you're asking me. To test the elevated water levels, I think that's an absolute uh, reasonable request. Is there a specific request from you? Though? I, I think that's what he's trying to get to. The request is that we do work together, address that health care issue and other, and other health care being a human right. We can't turn people away or put a price tag on their lives, literally. I mean, it's, it's important 
that we address the issue together. And I do think also, I do think about it. I'm sorry, but my constitution that I live under doesn't give you your health care as a right. The Hippocratic Oath, I'm sorry, I put that first. Well, I'm just saying, you said it's a human right. It's not a right in our constitution. I have taken two oaths, one to the United States Constitution, one to the state constitution. And the problem that we're going to have in November is which one do I honor if medical marijuana passes? Because you can't have it both ways. It's illegal federally, and it's legal state. I have a real dilemma. And this is one of the reasons, folks, we don't have legislators typically ask their questions. We're looking for specific questions here. But like we said earlier, we can agree to disagree. I have no problem if there's concern about that. That's a reasonable request and will be looked at. On other health care issues, there are some, you know, I'm being criticized for saying that I don't want to give everybody naloxone or Narcan. Well, I'll explain that to you. Number one is the false security. What they're doing now with Maine General and, I mean, Massachusetts General, they're tying themselves to doors so if they fall, the door opens and there's this alarm that goes off because they want to make sure somebody's there with a shot. That's one problem. It's a false security. The other problem that I really, really have with it is I asked the legislature this year to give us a tool, an additional tool to help fight heroin. It's when you catch somebody with heroin that has a dose, threaten them with a felony. Give the law enforcement and the courts the ability to give them a felony. Now, do we have any intent of using it? Of course not. What we're trying to do is say you have a choice to get a felony on your record or you can go to the rehab. We want them to go to rehab. We want to get them well. But we didn't. What they said was heroin's going to be a misdemeanor. We're going to slap you on the hand, send you again. Now, I would say to you that I am more compassionate for human life than the people that say your ACLU says that's not right. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Giving a person a misdemeanor with heroin, with trafficking and taking heroin is like leaving a loaded gun on your coffee table with a toddler running around. That's what I think it is. It's a very dangerous and deadly drug. And we should do everything we can, even if they don't want to, to get them into a rehab situation. I would rather put them in and fail than not have them put them in. I have a lady who calls me and she gives me her mind, a real, her mind, a piece of her mind. I think she probably gave me all her mind. And her issue is this. I have spent $38,000. I have no more savings. I've done everything I can for my son. But I can't get him into rehab. He's not ready. What are you going to do about it? No, no. What are you going to do about it? I said I would like to have a threat. You know, if I had this tool, I could threaten to go into rehab or go to jail. And she said, good. When is it going to take effect? Well, the legislature killed it. It's not going to happen. If you have heroin, it's a misdemeanor until you get up to, I think it's five doses. Then it becomes a felony. And you can have one shot a day for the rest of your life. And it's a misdemeanor. That is insane. How are you going to treat it if you can't have a way to get these people into rehab? This facility in Wyndham is going to have 200 beds. It's for inpatient, outpatient detoxification and drug treatment. It's going to have beds for mental illness. You know, everybody in the world says we want to take away your guns. I say take away the guns for people who are mentally ill. Mentally ill. Take their guns away. I'm all in. But 
we should also take away heroin off the street. If we know you're taking heroin, let's get them into treatment. Anybody else? Yes. I mean, no, no, sorry. I was high school there. She's up. I used to like her in high school. I had a crush on her in high school. <laughs> Good thing the first lady isn't here. I know. Yeah. Oh, she's not. She's not. Oh, my bad answer. Oh, yeah. Um, going into this this drug rehab and stuff, um, I understand a lot of what you're saying, and some of it I agree with, and some I don't. But what do we tell a parent whose whose child has died, and who says if that drug had been available, he or she would be with me today? Um, I know that the, there are um, a lot of addicts, and some of them do not want to go to rehab, or they can't bring themselves to go to rehab. But their families are paying the price. Not, I'm not talking money-wise. Emotionally, as the family does. Well, you know, look, but let me tell you this. We have this, this thing, if you have somebody that's mentally ill, and they're not competent, the parents can have them picked up and force them into treatment. Every single parent with an addict has that, that ability. They can get them treatment. Now, the problem with NACAN as a, a false security, if you want to give it, I don't have any problem, I have no problem with any family having NACAN in their home, in their car, in their pocket. I just don't think that the state needs to be paying for it. Number one. Number two, what happens if you give somebody Narcan and you haven't been properly trained because you're trying to save a life and the next morning the parents file a lawsuit? Because nobody addressed that in the bill. Nobody addressed how about the liability side. And then who pays for the training? You see, these are all things that bill didn't talk about. What that bill did was, we'll give everybody Narcan, false security, and the problem solved, now let's go knock on doors for the next election. The problem is nobody dealt with the consequences of mistakes, of training, and who pays. And they said, I could pay, but they didn't give me any money. Incidentally, folks, so that you all understand the limitations of a governor, he cannot appropriate money. The legislature appropriates money. The governor can. The governor, in the certain circumstances, can delay paying or he can refuse to pay if he believes there's a conflict. I really believe, in, in, the, in my heart, that giving me $15 million to make three people millionaires overnight is wrong for Maine, it's not ethical, it's not moral, and it's not right. And I would, I, will, I will challenge them to impeach me on that one. Because that is just sinful, what that bill does. And I told them ahead of time. I told them before I vetoed it, and they still ignored it. So, I'm not buying that one. That monkey's not on this shoulder. The LMF bond, yes, that is my responsibility, and I'm trying to make a point that we need to put more money into our people, into our kids, than into land. That's a political statement. Yes, sir. Uh, the page, Richard Bacon, I'm from the person that sends books to you from time to time. Mm -hmm. I hope you read it. Some I do, some I don't. I am. I said earlier that if I'm not into the Trump administration, I will be running against the industry. Now, don't tell my wife. <laughs> she hasn't said yes yet. Now, I 
I have to have permission. I have a boss. Anyone else? Well, I think the papers have a front page story now. <laughs> no. Well, well it's 710, so one more, okay? Yeah. All right. One more. Now, they can write a story, but believe me, it doesn't happen unless my wife says yes. And I didn't get that dog without my wife saying yes. <laughs> Let's see if that's reported tomorrow. Right? <laughs> All right, one more. Okay, uh, getting back to you for one night, getting back to the uh, drug problem and opiates, I, I heard, uh, I listened to you at the memorial event, uh, and you attacked the opiates pretty heavily. People like me, though, and it's all very. It's not the opiates as much as the doctors are prescribing. Well, that's what I'm talking about. People yeah. like me depend on it quite a bit. I wouldn't be standing here up right now without them. Well, uh, I agree. Right. Well, so when, you, when you attack, it's so difficult for me to get them even now. If you're going to make it more difficult, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if you're aware how difficult it is. Yeah. For Let me explain. Okay. Let me explain the bill. Okay? Uh, because I don't think you got the whole story because you must have got your information from a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is what the bill was. What the bill was, was that they were going to change the allowable dosage, with some exceptions. Exceptions were chronically ill people under physical constraints, that, and so they needed the opiates to just try to function. And elderly people, yeah, and then any elderly person who was in some severe, uh, like, you know, uh, cancers, and uh, like my mother-in-law, she passed away uh, last October, but she was taking 180 milligrams of Oxycontin daily. And it was, but, but it was keeping her alive. And even with that level, we would catch her occasionally, three or four times a month, in a fetal position, just crying because she was so pain, she was in so much pain. And those were exceptions. And believe me, there are many, many elderly in the state that called me and made sure that was in there. And if you if you know certain diseases, certain types of diseases, you would say absolutely yes if you ever experienced watching somebody go through it. So there were exceptions in there. There were normal doses, and and the normal doses meaning for somebody that's an acute had an operation three to seven days, somebody that's chronic that has to take it for 30, 60, but if it's a lifetime, it was totally different ballgame. I know it didn't come out in the newspapers. The good stuff never dies. Thank you. Thank you. One more over there, then I'll close it up. Thank you, Governor. I think the solution for the drug problem mainly is the dealers, the sellers of the drug to our people here. They're killing our people here. Yes. Until you, you, you arrest those people, put them in jail. There's no other solution. When they come here all the time, they're killing our children, our people, and the, and, and the, the legal system is not doing a damn thing about it. Well, let, let, let me try to explain what's going on. I, I agree with you. The users, a lot of users started on opiates that were prescribed, 75%. Others, they were recreational. I, I get it. The users, I would much rather get them cleaned up and put them to work. Because if they don't have a needle in their arm and their, their head is clear, then they can be a productive member of society. The traffickers, I'm all in. I want them out of here. I want them to be a guest of the state for the next 25 years. Unfortunately, the laws don't allow it. And we've tried to change the laws. And, and people say it's the courts. It's not always the courts. We have judges that are lenient. Yes, Maine is a lenient state. Maine is the least incarcerated people in America. However, we have put laws up. I tried to make heroin a felony. Fail. Tried to make a, a, a class C a class B. I tried to make a class B a class A, which means you get longer terms in jail. It failed the legislature. When I told you earlier, three types of legislators, they, I'm serious. You've got to hold a legislature's feet to the fire. They have to do what you ask. 
And if you ask them a question and they give you what you want to hear, be concerned. <laughs> the only good legislator is one that's going to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I'm not going to argue with you. Uh, when, when you when, when you have first degree murder in Maine, it's a long time. The problem is, it's not it's not just the le the the court system. It's the legal system as well. You have DAs and you have tr uh, defense attorneys. Defense attorneys look for deals. They try to blow it everything. And I agree. It's it, I agree. I don't, I'm not going to disagree that Maine is not lenient in the state. We are very lenient. I would love to see the death penalty. That's my choice. I, I prefer that. I would like to see any police officer that is killed and any baby that's killed by, a, by an adult, I would like to see the death penalty. Yeah. But I'm only one. Sir, thank you so much for your comments. We you appreciate it. Thank you very much. I, I will say this. I, I'm, I'm not going to say that the United States of America doesn't have crooked judges. I'm not even going to say the state of Maine doesn't have crooked judges. What I will say is this. We have an infrastructure in the state of Maine. We have a system in the state of Maine. Particularly, I can't speak for every judge that's been appointed, but I will tell you, that in the last five years, the judges have been appointed go through the ringer. They go through the ringer with the, the Judicial Selection Committee that I have put up, which is trial lawyers, DAs, uh, conservative lawyers, liberal lawyers. I mean, we try to put uh, everybody in, and they have to find, uh, you know, a good reason to promote, to ask them to go up to... Uh, to be nominated. Then I get three judges on my on my desk. I get the three finalists on every selection, and then I select them through there. I never know if they're Democrat or Republican, because I don't care about that. I only care about their resumes. And then I will interview them. And some judges, there was one judge that I put, I put up to the Supreme Court, and I thought he had made some bad decisions. In his career, and he was one of the finalists. And I sat with him, and we met, and we talked about it. And I asked him about one particular decision he made. And he looked at me. He says, "Judge, I, I mean," he says, "Governor, I had a brain cramp." He says, "A good thing the people were sensible enough to go to Supreme Court and have it overturned." And he says, "I just made a mistake." That person, you're in. Because he looked at me, didn't make excuses, he gave me the reason he made a mistake. So I was very proud to promote him from a spirit court to a, to a chief justice. So in Maine, like any place else, there are good and bad in every, in every uh, system. We try hard, but I will tell you this, the laws in Maine are pretty lax. Yes, we're pretty lax. And I just, that's what it is. I think, I think that uh, being the, I don't like being the least incarcerated people in America. I would like to be in the middle. I think being in the middle is a safe place. You can hide on both ends. <laughs> but being the number one puts, scares me a little bit. Being the least incar incarcerated sort of concerns me a little bit. What can we do about it? Get some people like me in there. <laughs> You gotta, it's going to take a long time to find another one like me. Everybody, thank let you. Me, let, let me just say this in closing. I, I want to thank you for you know coming out and listening. I, I'm, I, obviously, you know, I've heard it a couple of times. That we don't, I don't always agree with you. don't always disagree with you. Let me tell you something. I didn't get up in the morning when I'm shaving. I don't always agree with myself. <laughs> so, 
It is okay to have different opinions. It's okay at different times to change your opinions if you change, if you un understand something more deeply. One area that I am extremely sensitive about is domestic violence. The reason for that is I lived it. I know what it does to your body, I know what it does to your mind, and I know what it does to your ability to move forward and to become productive. It is difficult. Not everybody is as strong-minded as another one, so some people never get over it. I have seen ladies come into my office, or kids that come into my office, scared to death of men, or scared to death of teachers, or scared to death of somebody just because of an experience. So I am very, very strong on that, and that would be the first one I'd put on the, on the, you know, the death penalty, because I just think it destroys another life no matter what you think. So that's my opinion. And each and every one of us in this room have our opinions, and we are entitled to it, and that's what makes us a great country, having our own opinions. What we don't have, and what we're not entitled to have, is our own facts, or make up our own facts. And when you hear me complain about the press of Maine, is they make up facts as they go along, or they only keep parts of the story to make sure the whole story doesn't get out. That is very offensive to me. This whole issue with the bill about the opiates, this gentleman was concerned about the level. He's absolutely correct. There were exceptions on the chronic levels, and there were ex on the lifetime chronic levels, and there were exceptions for elderly with severe illnesses. You didn't see that reported. The naloxone, the Narcan. Nobody reported what I wrote in my veto message that the reason why is there were liabilities to the public, liabilities to the state, and the state police don't want to carry Narcan because of the cost of training. It's not, we, they didn't give us enough money. We don't have the money to do what they want us to do. So, what do you do? And if they would have said, we will work with you and make it real tough, if I could give a shot and I can't pick him up, bring him into the rehab, I'm all in. But what happens, I'll give you an example, Deering High School. One week, a junior at Deering High School had three Narcan shots in one week. And the third one, he got up with the class. He didn't go to hospital, he didn't get checked out. He's so used to it, he just came out of it with the class. So, if that is going to detect what that does is it, deteriorate, it will deteriorate our society. It will kill our society. And we're going to lose a whole generation. And we can least afford to lose a generation. So from that perspective, I, I make no excuses. That's my position. On other positions, I've had some real tough positions. Sometimes you can convince me that I'm too strong on it and you can twist it, flip me. Flipping me is not easy. I'm a heavy guy. But it does happen. Ask my wife. She flips me. I'd like a little snap and I run. Right, Ali? <laughs> Irene is sort of my relative. <laughs> okay. So the, the whole point was we are all entitled to our own opinions, and I, and I urge people to use it and to speak out. I urge you to remember that you don't have, you're not entitled to make up your facts, and then you need to hold the candidates that are running for office. The only way government gets better is at the ballot box. Believe me, it's at the ballot box. So you have a major responsibility at election time. And that's to elect people that you believe will be truthful to you and carry out your priorities. And so that's all I ask that you do. And if you do that, then we can all get a better government. Thank you very much.